Hello, welcome to Reflections once again. My name is Patrick Tomlinson. Today we are out in the field and we are at the Bronx Boathouse on Sheridan Avenue. Um, we are looking at one of the most energy efficient buildings built uh, in the Bronx. Behind me, as you can see, is the river. Uh, and to my right, which we will take a, a, a picture of, uh, is the Bronx Boathouse. In today's episode, we are focusing on a project called the Bronx Boathouse. This is an endeavor under the auspices of the Bronx River Alliance and seeks as one of its objectives the restoration and wholeness of our beloved Bronx River. A new state-of-the-art building was recently erected along the Sheridan Expressway here in the Bronx. This building is one of the foremost state-of-the-art buildings in the entire state of New York. We are advised by its owners and operator, the Bronx River Alliance, that it is a net zero carbon building. A net zero energy building or zero energy building is essentially a building with zero net energy consumption. Another simple way to put this is to state that the total energy used by the building on an annual basis is equal to the total renewable energy created on the site. This is achieved through innovative usage of technologies in the fields of construction and renewable energy. In this episode, you will be treated to a brief presentation by a representative of the Bronx River Alliance, along with a walkthrough of the project site. We hope you will enjoy our presentation, and if questions arise, please feel free to email, email us at our address given at the end of this presentation. For now, sit back, relax, and enjoy this clip of the Bronx Boathouse. Hi, I'm Jonah, and I am the Greenway Manager at the Bronx River Alliance. Um, the Bronx River Alliance is a public-private partnership with New York City Parks. We date back to 2001 as uh, an official kind of birth date for our organization, but we grow out of community efforts dating back to the 1970s with Bronx River Restoration. Um, those efforts led eventually to the Bronx River Working Group, which was a part of the Catalyst Program and Partnerships for Parks. And then finally in 2001, we were founded as a 501c3 nonprofit uh, and have been working ever since then to reclaim and restore the river for Bronx residents. Um, we operate across uh, five different programs. Um, Greenway is the one that I manage. Uh, and the goal of Greenway is to build a continuous trail along the entire length of the Bronx River. Um, uh, it's a multi-purpose trail for both bikers and pedestrians. Uh, and so far we've been pretty successful in that. We have a lot of it built, um, but there's still more, more work to go. Um, so my role in that and the Alliance's role is to make sure that community members are involved at every step of the way from even conceiving of the project and helping to um, empower their voices to government stakeholders uh, and then to the design stage of the process, fundraising, and then finally through construction, making sure that uh, progress is communicated to Bronx communities. And then finally, once it's completed, making sure that those parks and greenways that we build are active, are used, and hosting events like the Boogie Up the Bronx River Bike Ride. Uh, our next program is uh, Ecology, which is our program that is meant to restore the ecological health of the river. They do this through monitoring the water quality, through advocating for uh, better green infrastructure, for actually installing green infrastructure along the river, um, and also monitoring trash in the river, removing trash through a volunteer program. A great project to highlight is Project Waste, uh, which is one of the programs that helps to remove trash from the river, but also takes an inventory of what trash we're seeing. So that allows us to better understand who our polluters are. 
um, and advocate for change to stop pollution and stop trash going to the river in the first place. Um, another program we have is a recreation program, which is one of our more public facing programs. A lot of people know us as the paddling people on the Bronx River. Um, the recreation program provides free and low cost paddling to Bronx residents from spring through fall every single year. Um, we've kind of been on pause with that because of COVID, but we're hoping to start back up soon with some social distancing measures in place. Um, we also have an outreach program, which is kind of our uh, program that makes sure that we have good relationships with community members, helps organize volunteers, helps maintain relationships with different government agencies, uh, and is kind of our centralized process for community relations and volunteering. Uh, and then finally, we have our education program, which is um, our environmental education program that works through, with students from K through 12 and sometimes even into college uh, to bring the Bronx River to them, to bring environmental science into their lives and help them understand uh, science through a hands-on learning experience and its importance in the Bronx River. Um, so. You know, a big part of the segment is the Bronx River House. So for a long time, the Bronx River Alliance has been housed in Rodequa, which is the Bronx Borough headquarters of the New York City Parks Department, um, which is located um, right by Bronx Park East, but we haven't actually been on the Bronx River. So uh, a while back, a project called the Bronx River House was started with uh, help from some of our community partners, including Youth Ministries for Peace and Justice. Um, and working with various council members and other elected officials to get funding allocated. Uh, it was decided that we should have a space built for us that was directly on the Bronx River and the site that was chosen was in Starlight Park. It took a long time, uh, but finally I'm very happy to say that the facility is now completed and operational and our essential staff are in there now working today. Um, and it's a really exciting building uh, designed by Greg uh, Kiss from Kiss and Cathcart Architects, um, and it is dubbed by the New York Times as the greenest building in the South Bronx. So what makes it the greenest building in the South Bronx? There are a lot of different elements in terms of its design as well as the systems that it houses that make it super sustainable. So just the design. Uh, on the exterior of the building, um, you'll see grates along the facade. These, uh, and actually now that it's spring, they're starting to grow, this is what we call the vine wall. So the building has a green building envelope uh, to help not only purify the air around the building and add greenery and a nice visual effect, but also help insulate the building and reduce heating and cooling costs uh, during the summer and winter. Uh, the next phase is the moss wall. So this is a very experimental technique that we're trying uh, where we have just a portion now and we're hopefully going to expand to the full facade of the building. Uh, these concrete panels where moss is growing on the exterior of it on a vertical wall uh, and moss has a ton of different uh, ecologically beneficial features including air purification uh, and then these double layers, the concept was to take a forest, and if you've ever been in a forest on a hot summer day, you know how cool it is, and then flip it on its side. So we have the canopy of the vines on one side, and then on the other, we have the moss of the uh, undergrowth, you would say. And so that creates this little microclimate around the building that we're hoping to substantially decrease heating and cooling costs. Uh, once you go inside the building, a lot of it, um, as we have skylights throughout to increase natural light, which is good for people, but also good for energy costs, for less reliance on uh, artificial lighting, lots of venting to have natural breezes flow through the building, uh, ceiling fans in every single room to reduce a reliance on uh, air conditioning. Uh, and then, at, you know, now we can start talking about systems, mechanical systems, and this is where it gets kind of technical, but this is what really makes it sustainable. Uh, so one is the rainwater harvesting system. So we have a system built into this building that helps us collect water when it rains from around the building. We have various drains on the roof, uh, in the driveway, around the perimeter of the building that collect rain 
uh, and cycle it into a cistern underneath the building. And then it collects it and then pulls it up, pulls it through the system, treats it, purifies it with a UV light and different filters, and then uses it for our toilets, for our irrigation system, and for a few other uses for things like hosing down canoes and washing waders. Um, and so the idea is to one, offset the amount of stormwater that's going into the Bronx River or going into our sewer system that could potentially lead to a CSO polluting our river, uh, and also just saving water and, and upcycling it uh, for use in our building. The next system is our geothermal heating and cooling. So the building does have an HVAC system, uh, but that is uh, used in conjunction with a geothermal well. So uh, this enables the water that's pulled into the HVAC units is from a well that's very deep underground and maintains a constant temperature in, uh, I believe it's 50 something degrees, uh, which is a lot easier to bring up to temperature to heat or down to temperature to cool and reduces energy costs substantially. Another thing that we have is uh, radiant floor heating. So instead of heat just coming from vents uh, on the ceiling, which can be very inefficient, we have coils going throughout the building underneath the floorboards that, that heat up in the winter uh, and help heat the rooms. And because heat naturally rises, it's a much more efficient way to heat the building. Uh, and then lastly, we have a solar system. So uh, we have solar panels on the roof um, and we're hoping that um, you know, it's connected to the grid, not to a, a battery. So when there is excess during the day, it actually feeds the grid and helps contribute to other systems as well. Uh, and at night we uh, pull from the grid, but we are hoping that we produce enough energy on some hot summer days to have net zero energy consumption, meaning that we don't um, use any outside energy at all and have zero emissions from that uh, and potentially even contribute back to the grid. So it's very exciting um, and it's, it's kind of very in line of our mission of the Bronx River Alliance to be an environmentally friendly organization uh, and contribute to the environmental health of the borough and of the Bronx River. And so in terms of programming of this space, we unfortunately are not open to the public yet as all our stuff has not moved in and really the main restriction is COVID that uh, it's not safe to both our staff and the public to have people going in and out. But as soon as we're able to, we would love to have a big party. We're very excited to show off this building and it's going to greatly increase our capacity uh, to interact with the community in ways that we've never done before. Um, for example, we have never had our own space to really hold meetings, and so we have a lot of different meetings from Greenway team meetings, which are meetings that I uh, help organize uh, that discusses progress on the Greenway and other issues related to our parks and trails. Um, I've always had to borrow a conference room from a community partner or the parks department, and it will be nice to have our own space to host those meetings. Um, and also repay our partners for the many favors they've uh, given us over the years of letting us borrow their conference rooms and classrooms and lunch rooms. Um, but, you know, just having a, a place for people to meet, to convene, to hold events, uh, have indoor movie nights during the winter, have community meetings, talk about issues. Um, we have a classroom in the building, which is really exciting too. Um, so when we do our environmental education curriculum, we are often left outside. And sometimes we make visits to schools, but most of the time our uh, educator has to be outside and that's seasonally restricted. And also if it's pretty weather dependent. So if it rains or snows, we often have to cancel. And so to be able to have a classroom where kids can be there year round uh, and also be able to do indoor lessons and experiments and then go out outdoor and engage in the river is a huge benefit to everybody. Uh, we also have uh, a boathouse. So for our recreation coordinator, uh, deploying canoes to various sites along the Bronx River for paddling trips um, 
is a bit of a process. We have to get them out of storage facilities. We have a few along the Bronx River, put them on a trailer, bring them to the water, and then have the, the paddle, pack them back up and bring them back. Uh, but now, since we're one, right on the Bronx River, two in Starlight Park, which is right next to um, a portage that we can access directly, uh, and three, have uh, a garage that's big enough to actually store a full trailer of canoes, we will be able to um, easily expedite the process of deploying um, canoes throughout the Bronx River. Um, and the goal is to make it really easy to just take a canoe and go right in at Starlight Park. Um, so the facility is really equipped to help us operate better to serve the river and serve Bronx communities and it's really meant to be a space um, for not only our staff but for for everybody that loves the Bronx River, all Bronx community members and we're just very eager um, to have it open to the public and we'll certainly be communicating when it's ready. Um, we hope that when it is you come by and check it out and um, let us know what you think. Um, but we're going to be thinking about a lot of different ways to engage people in all these new spaces that we have in the building um, and show it off and use it to the best of our ability to really serve all of you. Thank you. You see, we have solar panels on top of the roof. Uh, these solar panels power the entire building uh, with energy. And any extra energy that solar panels uh, produce will be sent back to the grid to Con Ed and <clears throat> the property owner will receive a rebate, so to speak, or a uh, credit to their report. Also, you see the uh, vine fence on the outside of the building. The vine fence uh, acts as uh, a dual uh, service. First, it's uh, uh, for security reasons. Secondly, There'll be uh, vines that grow up the vine fence, covering the entire uh, uh, building and allowing the uh, vine leaf to shape or to shade the building, allowing uh, less sunlight to penetrate the building. Also, along with the vines, they'll put moss on the outside of the building. And in between the moss uh, on the uh, cement cladding of the building and the vine fence, it'll create a micro uh, climate in between. So if the, if the temperature, the ambient temperature out here is maybe 90 degrees, in between the building and the uh, uh, vine fence, the temperature will be about 85 degrees. So it's a five degree difference, which uh, aids in the uh, cooling of the building. So if you don't have so much uh, sun and heat penetrating the building, you won't have to use the air conditioning uh, as much. The building being a net zero. As we walk up to the driveway here, we see the uh, architectural designs of the different sized uh, squares, those also act as drainage. Each square uh, allows the water to drain down below the driveway. They go all the way down, the water travels down to the bottom of the driveway into a perforated uh, piping that we have, and that water is also collected into the cistern that goes in the back. This drain right here allows any water uh, from the park, any water from our uh, plaza, this driveway here, to go inside the trench drain. That trench drain also takes the uh, water back into the back, uh, into the cistern to use. If we could look here in, uh, directly inside the building, what we're looking at right now is the filtration system. That filtration system is used to filter the water that we've collected from the roof, the parking lot, and the driveway area. <coughs> So the, there's a, a UV filter on the on the, uh, on the uh, filtration system. Also, there's a 250 micron uh, catch filter here. So this would be the 250 micron filter here, and then the UV filter will be located here, looking like a silver submarine. This is also the control panels for the filtration system. As you can see, it displays what each pump does. So right now we have one pump that's coming on and it's at uh, 30 hertz and it'll rise up to a uh, maximum maybe 60 hertz. So right now the system is, acting, is uh, working as it should. I was speaking about the cistern. The cistern is buried here. So you see this, this manhole here is the inlet and the other one behind us 
is the maintenance. This tank is uh, 10,000 gallons of water, and it is approximately from this point, starts from here, goes all the way back past to about here, this spot. So the, the, the 10,000 gallons, uh, 10,000 gallon tank that's buried in, in the ground is approximately 20 feet uh, almost long, 20 feet long and approximately eight feet wide. All of the irrigation uh, is being fed by the cistern. You see the irrigation line here. And the, again, the vines, these vines will grow up the side of the building and give shade to the building and the uh, cement clad, which would aid in the uh, cool, heating and cooling of the building. Well is uh, pulling the water out, cooling off the air conditioning unit. It doesn't necessarily go into the air conditioning unit. It goes through the heat exchangers, which then suck the heat out of the uh, air conditioning unit, cooling the system down and allowing the system to work more efficiently if it is cooler. There's a, another well over here on the other uh, plaza. It also goes down 1,500 feet. And again, uh, we didn't tap into water when we drilled the wells. What we did was we drilled down 1,500 feet and any water that would seep in through the cracks uh, of, the, uh, the, of the well that we drilled, uh, they would be called fissures. So all of the water that seeps in through the fissures that's the water that we're harnessing. So you'll drill a hole straight down 1,500 feet, no water whatsoever, pull out your equipment, and then the water will begin to fill in. Uh... Okay, as we were talking about the wells that we drilled 1,500 feet down, these would be the supply and return lines. Supply and return lines. The, the water from the well, again, it doesn't go into the air conditioning unit. What it does is it goes into this heat exchanger down here water goes into the heat exchanger, cooling down the heat exchanger, the plates in the heat exchanger, and then going right back into the well. We'll pull the water out of the well at 55 degrees approximately, and when we send it back down into the well, it's probably no more than 70 degrees uh, 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 difference uh, in the water that we send back down. So 50, 55 degrees out of the well and 70 degrees going back down into the well in order to cool down the air conditioning. Once we cool down the air conditioning, that allows the heat pumps here, these units here, you see, that allows these heat pumps to aid in the uh, cooling, heating and cooling of the building. We uh, take the, hot, the, the well water uh, that was running through the heat exchange, it goes back down inside, but the water that runs inside the, the uh, heat, the heat pump is recycled uh, round and round. Uh, here we have the radiant heat manifold. Uh, again, uh, the water from the heat pumps circulates this water uh, in every room. Of, uh, every room uh, has the radiant heated floor, uh, except for the mechanical room where we're standing now. The uh, lobby uh, has no radiant heated floor, but every other room inside the building has radiant heated floor. And again, uh, the water is circulated through the heat pumps and you can turn the temperature from, in each room, you can change the temperature of the floor. And of course, uh, if the floor is warm, that heat rises up and that uh, aids in the heating of the building. So now we don't have to run our conventional heating system as much as we normally would without the radiant heated floors. There's uh, two zones here. You see the PEX tubing with two zones. And then if we come to the next side, there's uh, six zones here. And altogether there's 27 zones, I believe. The other manifold is located inside the, uh, lock, the lobby restroom. And again, if, if you pull back some, you can see just how much of the plumbing and piping is needed for the radiant heated floor and what we're using as far as the heat pumps, the heating system. Now, it does look like we have uh, a lot of pumps here, but 
most of these pumps are redundant pumps. In case one goes out, we'll always have another. Okay, this would be considered the large office area. The large office area. And here, here we have the radiant heated floors. So what we did was we have 11 inches of concrete uh, poured down and then we put uh, blue dowel uh, insulation. We put the radiant heated tubes on top of that. And then we poured three inches of concrete with uh, fiberglass meshing inside we cut the meshes to uh, allow the expansion and contraction of the tubes and not necessarily crack the uh, uh, concrete as we poured. This is considered the cruise locker room. This is considered the cruise locker room. And as we come back out of the building through into the garage area. Here we have booster pumps that we're using in order to uh, increase the amount of pressure coming into the building. Again, the building is a net zero building. Uh, as we can see right now, it's raining and all of this rain that it touches the driveway will, again, like I said, it'll be collected into the cistern in the back. There's a trench drain on the far end of the driveway here that collects the water. And of course, each architectural uh, square you see here, that uh, allows the water to seep through, go down to the uh, lower level of the uh, driveway and down into a perforated pipe where that water is also then collected and sent back into the cistern. As it stands right now, this building will be considered the greenest building in the state of New York uh, at this moment. Uh, there's a few things that are cutting edge now, uh, technology here. Uh, the rain harvest system, which I earlier called it a filtration system, but the proper name for it is a rain harvest system. And again, we're witnessing the rain right now, and the harvest system, of course, is taking in all of the water, and that water, again, will be used uh, to flush toilets and to uh, uh, irrigate the landscaping. Also, the water on the roof is being collected into the cistern, and the water that touches the east side of the building is collected into a drain that goes along the east side of uh, uh, the building at the base to collect all of the rainwater that comes in. And again, this is a cutting edge technology. This building, uh, once opened up, will be the greenest building in the state of New York, the Bronx River House. Uh, my name is Gerald Benet, and I work for uh, Bay's Specialty General Contractor. Thank you, Gerald, for your... Uh most in insightful overview of the Bronx River project. Thank you so much for your time. You're welcome.